Purloin was part of a strategy so powerful, Pokemon was forced to change how a move worked. Here's how it happened. Our story begins with Generation 5. Generation 5 is, in my mind, the first iteration of modern competitive Pokemon. Generation 5 introduced a ton of stuff that became mainstays, like Team Preview and even Landorus. Generation 5 introduced over 40 new abilities, many of them very powerful. Gen 5 also introduced the concept of hidden abilities, giving most older Pokemon a new ability and giving many new Pokemon additional ways of playing once their hidden ability was released. Now, as you might imagine, because of the sheer volume of ways that specific moves can interact with specific abilities, some very niche edge cases may have slipped through the cracks. One of these edge cases is specifically what allowed Purloin to become unstoppable under the right conditions. Our story begins with the ability Prankster, one of the new abilities introduced in Generation 5. Prankster is a funny ability that gives all moves that don't do damage an additional stage of priority. Basically, all moves have some priority assigned to them, ranging from negative 7 to plus 5, with most moves having a priority of 0. When a turn begins, Pokemon move in speed order within their priority bracket. So the fastest Pokemon with plus 5 priority goes first, then any slower Pokemon with plus 5 moves, then the fastest Pokemon that used a plus 4 move, etc. This is why moves like Helping Hand and Protect tend to go before other moves. They have higher priority. We know the Prankster adds one stage of priority to all moves that don't do damage, which normally just takes moves from plus 0 to plus 1. Though for some stuff like Protect means they'll protect before other Pokemon, not that there is any advantage to that. But what made Purloin specifically so broken? Lots of Pokemon get Prankster, including many good competitive Pokemon like Whimsicott and Thunderous. What was it that set Purloin apart? It has to do with Purloin's specific move pool, and with one move in particular, Assist. If you're like me, you probably think of Assist as the kind of garbage move that Skitty would use on your playthrough of Pokemon Emerald. And in most cases, you would be right. Assist is a move that randomly calls another move of the Pokemon in your party, including Pokemon that have been knocked out. This allows Pokemon to use moves they can't normally learn, though because Assist is random, it's pretty inconsistent. In Gen 5, there were 10 Pokemon lines that could learn Assist. And of those, the only one that also had access to Prankster was Purloin. Meaning, if you wanted a Pokemon to use Assist and have Prankster, Purloin and Lipard were literally the only Pokemon in the game that you had access to. But why do we want a Pokemon with both Assist and Prankster? Randomly calling another move with an increased stage of priority surely cannot be worth all that much, right? Well, what if Assist wasn't calling moves at random? Imagine you had a team with Purloin and Lipard with Assist. And in the back, you had Charmander and Charmeleon, both of whom only knew Flamethrower. In that case, every single time you used Assist, you would end up using Flamethrower. Additionally, there are certain moves that can't be used via Assist, such as Protect. In other words, it's possible to have a team with four moves on every Pokemon that still cause Assist to only call one specific move. We're getting closer to our broken combo now. We've established that Purloin and Lipard are the only Pokemon in Generation 5 with both Prankster and Assist, allowing Assist to be used with increased priority. We've also established that it's possible to have a team where Assist always calls the same move. And what move do you think is so powerful that it's worth building a whole team around just to use it with priority? Let me know in the comments, I'm curious what you all think. The answer may surprise you. The move this entire team is built around is actually Dive. Dive is an 80 base power physical water move introduced in Generation 3, with the same mechanics as Dig and Fly. On the first turn of the attack, the user enters what is called a semi-invulnerable state, disappearing from the battlefield and becoming immune to nearly all forms of damage. On the second turn, the user reappears and completes the attack. It's also worth noting that you didn't have to use Dive for this strategy, you could use Dig or Fly as well. Dive was considered the strongest because it doesn't miss and no type is immune to water, though there was a variant at one point that used Shadow Force as well. How is it possible that a strategy I described as unbeatable centers around Dive? Well, beloved viewer, I haven't given you all the pieces yet. Like a dog who happily devours the last piece of a puzzle, preventing its completion forever, I have left one crucial detail out of our equation. And it is time for me, the dog, to regurgitate what was taken from you, the viewer who loves puzzles. We've talked about abilities. We've talked about moves. What have we not talked about? Items. 
And what's great about items in this case is that just like everything else in the setup, they're items that are almost always considered useless. Lagging Tail and Full Incense are two items that have the same effect. They make the holder move last within their priority bracket. But if a Pokemon holding a Lagging Tail uses a move with priority zero, it will go after all other Pokemon with priority zero moves. If it uses a move with priority one, it will go before any moves with priority zero and below, but after all other moves that also have priority one or higher. These items are actually used in competitive Pokemon on occasion and on Prankster Pokemon no less, but they're used in conjunction with the moves Trick or Switcheroo to give to an opponent. In 99% of all cases, these are items that only hurt the user and don't offer any benefit. This is that 1% case. With an item that makes a Pokemon move last in their priority bracket, we now have all the pieces to understand the strategy known as Dive Cats. Let's put it all together. Oh, before we do that, we should talk about another 1% case. My subscribers! Currently, only 1% of my viewers are subscribed, and I'd love to get that number up. Even if you think you're subscribed, I'd appreciate you double checking. I work really hard on my videos, so I hope you feel like they're deserving of a sub. Anyway, time for the grand reveal. You lead off with Purloin and Lipard, both with a move Assist. Lipard holds the Lagging Tail, while Purloin holds the Full Incense. In the back, you have Pokemon that have moves that result in Assist always calling Dive. Lipard and Purloin both use Assist, and because of their Prankster ability, they move before any Pokemon using moves with zero priority or below, which is most moves. Thanks to Dive, both cats vanish from the field and can't take any damage. And here's the cool part. Prankster activated on assist because it doesn't have a base power. But now, Dive is being used, and Prankster doesn't activate anymore because Dive does have a base power, meaning the second turn of the attack doesn't have any priority. And because it doesn't have priority, that means that the second turn of Dive will go after your opponent's Pokemon have already used their moves. In other words, Purloin and Lipard disappear before your opponents can attack and reappear after they have already attacked, making them functionally invincible. If a team lacks specific tools, this strategy is unbeatable. Even though Purloin and Lipard are unlikely to actually KO your opponent's whole team, as long as they do any damage, they'll win when the timer runs out because they'll have more HP remaining. Now, there was counterplay that could beat this team, to be clear. If a team had any move with increased priority that did damage, you could do damage to the cats before they hit underwater. If you ever managed to take a KO, the team would just instantly lose because the Pokemon in the back had such a limited move pool. Even if you didn't have a damaging move, if you had a Pokemon with Sandstream or Snow Warning, you could deal passive damage to the cats and protect on the second turn of Dive, slowly winning a War of Attrition. Other Prankster Pokemon were also a nuisance, especially Thunderous. Thunderous with Taunt could shut down the entire strategy because in Generation 5, Dark types weren't immune to Prankster moves. Despite all these weaknesses, the team did still see some play. It mostly showed up towards the tail end of Generation 5, though at this point I can't remember if that was the later half of 2012 or some point during 2013. I think if the strategy had been discovered during the first competitive format of 2011, it might have had a chance to win a tournament. 2011 was a format called a Regional Dex Format. Only Pokemon native to Unova could be used, aka the new Pokemon introduced in black and white. Teams were very limited because of this, and had less options than modern teams in general. I think if someone had brought Dive Cats to a regional, there's a very real chance they could have won, as many Thunderous didn't run Taunt, there weren't that many priority moves in general, and Sand and Hail were non existent. Unfortunately, Dive Cats never had a deep tournament run, but it did show up online and had a few very hilarious wins. Going into Generation 6, Game Freak realized the danger of Dive Cats and changed the way Assist worked to make sure it couldn't call any of the semi-invulnerable moves. There was one variant of the strategy that actually did win a tournament, albeit an unusual one. At US Nationals for many years, you had the main tournament where players competed to win glory and a chance to compete at the World Championships. Obviously, nobody cares about that. What we're here to talk about is one of the most notorious side events at the tournament, the multi-battle tournament. Now, multi-battles are a bit of a weird beast. They're double battles like VGC, but they're two players against two players. So for each individual player, they actually function a bit like single battles. VGC battles are four Pokemon versus four Pokemon, but in multi-battles, each team has six total Pokemon, which gives your team more options, though each player only controls three of them, resulting in fewer choices for each individual. This tournament was tough. It was on the Sunday of the event, and registration was always early. I myself slept through it once or twice. 
Moreover, this specific multi-battle tournament had a rather restrictive rule. You weren't allowed to talk to your partner. Trying to double target a slot, or even something as simple as protecting one Pokemon and attacking with the other, becomes a momentous task when you aren't allowed to talk to each other. My teammate and I theorized that we could try kicking each other under the table to communicate. We were eliminated in the first round every year. For most side events of Pokemon tournaments back in the day, the prize for doing well was a few orange peels. For whatever reason, the prize for winning this side event was always a console, like the Wii U. For a Pokemon side event, it's an amazing prize, so the field was actually pretty competitive. In a format you would expect to be dominated by Pokemon like Mega Kangaskhan and Mega Salamence, would you like to know the duo that proved to be unstoppable, winning the whole event? Lipard and Mega Houndoom. Let's start with Lipard. We've already talked about how Prankster Assist allows Lipard to use a move that it ordinarily can't with increased priority. But what was Lipard doing if not going for a swim? The answer is using my personal least favorite move of all time. Welcome to Void Cats. Dark Void is supposed to be Darkrai's signature move, but in VGC, it's Smeargle's signature move. It's an 80% accurate move that puts both opponents to sleep. Brothers Randy and Jimmy Kwa, VGC veterans who are basically the real-life equivalent of Ingo and Emmett, decimated the tournament with their Lipard and Houndoom team. Assist is a little different in a multi-battle, in that it can only call moves from one player's side. This means that you can get around that pesky requirement that your team needs to be full of garbage moves, as one side can devote themselves entirely to Void Cats, while the other player focuses on doing damage. The basic strategy was to use Assist to call Dark Void turn 1, while Houndoom sets up a nasty plot. Then turn 2, Lipard would Sunny Day, as Houndoom used a Solar Power plus 2 Stab Heat Wave in the Sun, decimating the opponent. This even has a chance to KO bulky Pokemon like Cresselia, as well as Pokemon that resisted it like Mega Salamence. Also, Houndoom before it Mega Evolves has the Unnerve ability, meaning items Lumberry and Chestaberry don't work at stopping the strategy. You can even do something very evil, where you Dark Void without Mega Evolving. Then next turn, Mega Evolve, activate the berries, and Dark Void again before your opponent can attack, plunging them back into nightmares. Dark Void was heavily nerfed going into Generation 7, and now will fail if any Pokemon other than Darkrai uses it. Though, this is probably in response to Smeargle more than Lipard. Nonetheless, Lipard and Purloin got some time in the sun thanks to this ridiculous and very specific interaction. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you to DeWobblefett and Randy Qua for their help in gathering the information for this video. There's a ton of stories like this that have happened during my over a decade playing VGC, so if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, let me know in the comments, and please consider subscribing. See you next time.